Good evening. It's good to be in the house of the Lord again tonight to worship him and to sing his praises. For he alone is worthy of our praise. And we thank him tonight for the privilege that is ours, the health, the health and strength that we have to come into his presence to worship him. We welcome each and every one of you. It's good to see you. We just pray that you'll right enter right into the worship. There's no strangers here, just as one commercial said, uh, friends you haven't met yet. And we welcome you with us tonight. It's good to see uh, Majors John and Donna Golding and Major Francis Golding and Inus. Is that right? Good to have you with us tonight. We pray that you'll feel right at home as you worship with us. We're going to begin our service this evening by singing a song that's 410 in your songbook. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you now. It was on the back, but it's not on this one. <laughs> Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord, and he will truly give you rest by trusting in his word. Let's stand as we sing it together, please. <laughs> sing a song that I can hear being sung in my memory uh, by the older comrades uh, when they used to sing we the people of thy host standing now before thee for thy power O Holy Ghost we as one implore thee send the power send it we implore thee and I pray this evening that we'll be just as earnest in intent and in our hearts cry out to God. Because without him, we can do nothing. And uh, if there's any evidence of God's working in our midst, it is because he has graciously been answering prayer. It's got nothing to do with us. It's got nothing to do with our talents. But it's got everything to do with God responding to earnest prayer. And so this evening, I ask again, that you would not only sing these words, but that you would pray these words right from your heart. Uh, we've got lots to be praying about and for in these days. And just to mention, last Sunday night, I asked that you would pray for a young man who was going to have surgery this past week, and he did. And uh, it seems to be that there's going to be a good prognosis. And it wasn't as bad as what they thought. 
and we praise God for that. And Donna Dirtle, sorry to name you out here tonight, Donna, but Donna came to me last week and said, I'm going back for another report. And you know, anybody who's ever had cancer, you always wonder what it's going to be. And she said, I'm a miracle because I had a real good report again this week. And we praise God. We praise God for that this evening because, again, that's another evidence and answer to our prayers. We may not always understand why some prayers seemingly go unanswered and others are answered. We have to leave that to God. But I believe whatever it is we pray about, he changes us and he gives us the strength to be able to endure whatever it is that his will might be for our lives. So sing it, my comrades, this evening, we the people of thy host standing here before thee. <laughs> Sid, if he would come to the platform and he would lead us in prayer this evening. Let not self hold any part as we lay before thee. Be thou conqueror of each heart. We as one implore thee. Let's sing it together, please. <laughs> this evening and we have been singing our prayer. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Lord, we thank you for the, the presence of your Spirit in these past weeks and months. We thank you, Lord, for what's happening here. And as Major Barber's already said, Lord, it's, it's not about us, it's about you. Your Spirit 
imploding and, and, and exploding through us to others. We pray, oh God, you will accept our thanks. We ask that we would be worthy, Lord, and, and yet we can only be made worthy through Jesus. And so, Father, we, we come there this, this evening and we pray especially that, that if there is one who is falling short in their relationship with you, we pray, Father, that you will help them to come back tonight. Lord, we have been hearing a lot about getting ready for home. And Father, we thank you for the assurance that we have that, that if, if the breath we're breathing now were the last earthly breath, we'd be ready because you have made us ready. And so we pray, Lord, that before we leave this place tonight, not one person will go home unsaved. Father, thank you for every blessing. Thank you for another wonderful day. We don't know, we don't have the words to say it, Lord, but we know that you know what's going on in our hearts. So accept our thanks. Prepare us for home. Help us to be living witnesses for you during the week. And help us to please you today and tomorrow. And until Jesus comes, amen. Just a few short announcements for you. One that is not in our bulletin and for the men here. There will be men's fellowship tomorrow night at 8 o'clock and all the men are welcome to uh, come along for light up the night. And uh, there will be a wood stove demonstration and you're all invited to come and see. So that's 8 o'clock tomorrow evening. Just a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, 50 plus, there is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for you as well. Tickets for the fall sale and luncheon are available. And as well, the Newfound Brass Christmas concert will be taking place here at the CBS Corps on Saturday, November 25th at 7 o'clock. Tickets are now available and you can get them from our, our Brian Hart, our bandmaster. And I just want to mention that two of our youth are in this uh, concert band, and we just ask that uh, you'll come out and support them, and that's Nathan and, uh, and Richard. So we're looking forward to this wonderful evening, so be sure to get your, your ticket from, uh, from Brian. And as well, uh, starting on Wednesday, our tickets for our core Christmas dinner uh, will be available as well. And just a reminder that we are looking for people to get signed up for our Christmas kettle ministry. Please be sure to uh, see Ted Snook and to get your letter, which is at the back of the church, so that you can complete the hours that you are available to help us out. And at this time, I'll ask the ushers to come for your offering, please. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue to bow in your presence, Lord, we say thank you once again for the gift of this day. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your saving grace, and Lord, for your promise to always be with us. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. And Lord, as we give back to you of our tithes and offering, it's our prayer you will bless these gifts. We just ask that you will multiply them. And Lord, it's our prayer that they will be used to extend your kingdom here below. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
for me to share in some courses together tonight at the time of St. Inspiration. And uh, just to let you know that um, Santa Claude picked out our courses for tonight. And uh, we're going to sing some older ones that he's chosen. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. This is one I'm sure that you'll be on your feet before we finish singing. Let's sing it. When I think of It's uh, ties in nicely with major sermon this morning. Keep looking up to heaven, your redemption draws nigh just a little longer, and we'll meet him in the sky. Hopefully, you are ready for that encounter. Let's sing. has a burning testimony on your heart and you want to share it with us tonight your opportunity will be so after we've sung that chorus yesterday today forever jesus is the same we may change but jesus never glory to his name so if you want to share a quick testimony you'll have opportunity to do that after this course
tell you about Jesus. You're right, Wes. Every time I get the chance, I'm going to say it. I'm going to tell the world about Jesus. Uh, sometimes, every now and again, I drive someone to the hospital for a cancer run. And that is my opportunity to share Jesus. And on other occasions, I'd like you to surprise Carol Ann tonight. I'd like to see about 15 here tonight on your own. Come on. Do it. Do it. Not for me, for Jesus. And for yourself. God bless you. Okay, so we're here at 14. <laughs> God bless you. My name. No? Not yet. But I hope one day to be. Uh, God favors his children. And by the grace of God, I am a child of God. I recently had a, a, a hip revised. I had a hip that wasn't supposed to be put in some years ago, and the doctor that put it in decided he wouldn't like to talk to me about it for several years. So this, this past <laughs> summer, I had another physician let me know that it was not a good thing to leave that in there. So uh, I found a physician to take it out for me, and it, it, was a, it was a struggle even for him, though he did it constantly, day after day. And uh, for three months, I was supposed to have some pretty rugged and rigid restrictions. Well, I went to see him after six weeks, and he said it looks great, and I'm just lifting all the restrictions. You know what? God was right there before him and made everything perfect so that he said, you're going to be fine. You just do what you want. Praise God, because he did it. Amen. I have something in my heart that I can't explain. It's a joy that never grows old. I've tried to tell it again and again, but it's better help than told. I'm so happy tonight to be here to testify for Jesus Christ. When I was out in the world, I realized I needed to save him. And I got a sister in Lee, May Valley. She's been searching me for Salvation Army for years. And so many, many times she prayed for me. And this is the results tonight. Jesus Christ still saved. I was up to Brother Wilson's to see if he was talking to him. I was telling him about the first one I had, the first heart attack. In 2004, I'm going to make it short. In 2004, I had a heart attack. I was 21 days in the hospital in Winston Anthony, waiting to get to St. John's. And while I was there, I had a attack of kidney stones. So I with the heart attack, and they couldn't treat me for the stones because of the heart attack. And the doctor come in, he said, Mr. Cannon, he said, there's nothing we can do. You're going to have to bear the pain. I said, you know, doctor, that devil is one slave in. He tried to kill him in a heart attack. That didn't work. He tried to stone me again. And I said, I said, you know, doctor? I said, God, I said, he prayed and pastor for 21 days when I was in St. Anthony Hospital. And I want to give Jesus Christ the glory for bringing the truth. I love him tonight. Man is good to be saved. Amen. Good to be coming by the blood. I'm ready to go. I said to the doctor, I said, in the way. I said, the devil lose. If I got, I'm going home. If I don't, I'm going back to Roddy. <laughs> <laughs> traveling across the continent, literally. Uh, I left uh, Seattle, Washington, 9.30-ish 
their time last night, which was in the wee hours of the morning here, and have been traveling. So I'm feeling a little bit like I'm walking on clouds right now, but it's so good to be home. And um, I, I had a, just an amazing week of training with world-class trainers in, in the field that I'm studying, and I'm thankful for that opportunity. But I, I really am of the belief that two are better than one, especially when it comes to traveling. And I said to my husband, oh, I really don't like this traveling alone. It's not fun. But I have to tell you that even in that aloneness, there was that presence of God with me. And so in the depth of who I was, you know, when I was, you know, getting these taxis to take me from here to there and not really knowing who it was I was getting in with and always able to strike up a conversation and, um, I just had this presence that God was with me. And, and of course we do, don't we, as believers? That, that's really what it's all about. And to know that he's with, a, with us in all of the circumstances of life. And I always pray, you know, plane rides are another thing, right? You never know who you're going to be sitting with and all of that stuff. And uh, so last night when I was in Seattle, I'm going to make this really quick. Um, it's this just an example of, you know, when you ask God, he delivers. <laughs> so be careful what you ask him. Um, there was this lady who was sitting up in the waiting area a little bit further, and she was having this conversation with someone that was really, um, I would call it searching, but really dismissing God. And um, I thought, you know, there was a part of me that really wanted to step in and say, you know what? <laughs> but then I really didn't feel that's not my style as a, as a witness. And I thought, I prayed, Lord, if you want me to talk to this lady, because I do believe in a word in season. I am a believer of that. I said, if you want me to talk, because it's not about me and me having my say, it's about what you want me to do. So if you want me to talk to this lady, you're gonna have to sit me with her. So it was really interesting because the <coughs> flight from Seattle to Vancouver was 35 minutes, I didn't know that, and there were 11 people on the plane. I was blown away by that. But guess what? Who was sitting with me? That lady. And I thought, all right, God, I've asked. You've delivered. And, and even then, I, I prayed, God, like, what you want me to say. Again, it's not about me. It's not about, you know, bringing my views and that. And so it was just a really sweet conversation. She was on her way to Australia to visit her boys, and we made connection, as I always do. I invite people to Newfoundland. So my husband, you know, after this conference, there's going to be all, there may be all kinds of people coming knocking on our door. But I just thank God for that opportunity. Number one, to be with me wherever I go, and uh, to give word of witness in season as he anoints me and I praise him for that. That's an amazing relationship. If you don't have that relationship with God, you can't. You can't accept him tonight. Well, we're going to sing a chorus of invitation. It is an old one. Harvest time. Harvest time. The leaves are falling. The Savior's calling. Do not wait. It's growing late. Behold, the fields are white. It's harvest time. Let's share it together. Harvest time.
I'm free. Oh, glory to his name. Jesus reached down into the gutters of sin and shame. Now, my testimony is not that God reached down into the gutters of sin and shame. Because I was saved from a very, very young age. God's hand has been on my life. And I, I've said before, I always felt like I never really had much of a testimony. But my testimony is of God's keeping power. And God has kept me. And I know that there are those here who are like me. But then there are those whom God has scooped right out of the very gutters of sin. And we still all, no matter what our testimony is, we give praise to God. Because he is our redeemer. Let's stand and let's share it together. saved us from a life of misery. We have no idea, either now or later, of what we've been saved from. If you could see your future, if you could see eternity, where you would have ended up, what you would have had to experience, if you could see the curtain drawn back on what Jesus took for us. What he endured on those three days in the tomb. What he swallows every day as people repent of their sins. You have no idea. I have no idea what he saved me from, but I praise him tonight. Uh, we're going to have two things happen now. We're going to have a piano selection by Brian, and uh, it's entitled, I'll Not Turn Back. It's a beautiful selection. Then we're going to have John chapter 19, and uh, we are into, there are no more scriptures. There's no story that's more sacred to us. Then we're going to see unfold in the video of John 19. But I'm going to pray before we do that. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus Christ, tonight I come to you and I ask you for your blessing upon these moments. I ask, Lord Jesus, that once again, that your Holy Spirit would come and shut us in with you and that we would hear from you the glad tidings of the gospel. And as we look into that 
that day that changed everything. I pray, O oh God, that your spirit will guide us to vivid images Amen. of what happened to you so that what's happening to us could happen to us. And Lord, I do pray as well tonight for a powerful and unparalleled spirit of conviction here tonight. I pray for it, Lord, over the internet that people are watching. Amen. I pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit, I pray that your Holy Spirit will seize the hearts and the minds of men and women tonight and compel them to almost have to say out loud either yes I will or no I won't. Lord, bring us to a verdict tonight, I pray. And this not in human strength, but through Jesus Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Soldiers made a crown out of thorny branches and put it on his head. Then they put a purple robe on him and came to him and said, Long live the king of the Jews. And they went up and slapped him. Pilate went back out once more and said to the crowd, Look, 
I will bring him out here to you to let you see that I cannot find any reason to condemn him. Look, here is the man. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Crucify him! Crucify him! You take him then and crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. We have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. Die. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back into the palace and asked Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer. He will not speak to me. Remember, I have the authority to set you free and also to have you crucified. You have authority over me only because it was given to you by God. So the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a worse sin. When Pilate heard this, he tried to find a way to set Jesus free. If you set him free, that means you are not the emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he took Jesus outside and sat down on the judge's seat in the place called the Stone Pavement. In Hebrew, the name is Gabbatha. It was then almost noon of the day before the Passover. Pilate said to the people, Here is your king. Kill him. Do you want me to crucify your king? The only king we have is the emperor. <laughs> then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified.
So they took charge of Jesus. He went out, carrying his cross, and came to the place of a skull, as it is called. In Hebrew, it is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and they also crucified two other men, one on each side, with Jesus between them. Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. Many people read it because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city. The notice was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. What I have written stays written. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They also took the robe, which was made of one piece of woven cloth without any seams in it. The soldiers said to one another, let's not tear it. Let's throw dice to see who will get it. This happened in order to make the scripture come true. They divided my clothes among themselves and gambled for my robe. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. Here's your son. Then he said to the disciple, She is your mother. From that time, the disciple took her to live in his home. Jesus knew that by now, everything had been completed. And in order to make the scripture come true, he said, <laughs> I am thirsty. A bowl was there, full of cheap wine. So a sponge was soaked in the wine, put on a stalk of hyssop, and lifted up to his lips. Jesus drank the wine. It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then the Jewish authorities asked Pilate to allow them to break the legs of men who had been crucified and to take the bodies down from the crosses. They requested this because it was Friday, and they did not want the bodies to stay on the crosses on the Sabbath, since the coming Sabbath was especially holy. So the soldiers went and broke the legs of the first man, and then of the other man, who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear into Jesus' side. And at once, blood and water poured out. The 
one who saw this happen has spoken of it, so that you may also believe. What he said is true, and he knows that he speaks the truth. This was done to make the scripture come true. Not one of his bones will be broken. And there is another scripture that says, people will look at him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph, who was from the town of Arimathea, asked Pilate if he could take Jesus' body. Joseph was a follower of Jesus, but in secret because he was afraid of the Jewish authorities. Pilate told him he could have the body, so Joseph went and took it away. Nicodemus, who at first had gone to see Jesus at night, went with Joseph, taking with him about 100 pounds of spices, a mixture of myrrh and aloes. The two men took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen cloths with the spices, according to the Jewish custom of preparing a body for burial. There was a garden in the place where Jesus had been put to death, and in it there was a new tomb where no one had ever been buried. Since it was the day before the Sabbath, and because the tomb was close by, they placed Jesus' body there. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the... $10.5 million to Omar Qadar. Mr. Qadar was a former child soldier and was subsequently imprisoned in Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. He was paid the money because his rights had been violated as a Canadian citizen. One newspaper said, in 2010, the Supreme Court of Canada sternly rebuked the government. It found that the interrogation of Mr. Qadar by Canadian intelligence officials at Guantanamo offends the most basic Canadian standards about the treatment of detained suspects. Separately, another court, the Federal Court of Canada, also found that the conservative government had violated Mr. Qadar's rights by not actively seeking his return. I wonder if anybody ever apologized to Jesus. He was brutalized by the Roman government. Jesus was brought before the governor, one Pontius Pilate, after he'd been struck, spat upon, and slapped by the Jewish leaders and their soldiers. And then he comes before Pontius Pilate Pilate has become very, very, very famous. The Apostles' Creed, dating back to late 4th century, says, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Likely, 
I've thought about this. Not a minute goes by in this world where someone somewhere is not reciting that creed and mentioning the infamous name by saying Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the governor. He was called a prefect. But we use the term governor. At the time of Jesus' trial, he was the governor of the Roman province of Judea. And recent excavations have found plates that verifies this, that he was there and served in that position from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36. History tells us he was a brutal man, well known for his lack of compassion and his cruel judgments. In fact, according to Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who wrote about the time of Jesus, he said that Pilate was deposed and sent back to Rome by Lucius Vitellius after harshly suppressing a Samaritan uprising. Pilate was a harsh man with incredible power. But he had not handled the case like Jesus Christ. Jesus, I'd say Pilate wished that he'd never met Jesus. The Jewish leaders brought Jesus to Pilate and he says to them, about one o'clock, one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, take him yourselves. Judge him by your law. <laughs> but they said, we're not looking for a scourging or something. We want the death sentence. We have no right to execute anybody, they objected. The Jewish leaders did have laws. They did have punishment. But they were seeking the death sentence and never had the authority in Roman days to execute anybody. So they wanted Pilate to do the dirty work. But the problem was Pilate was governed by Roman law. Jesus was innocent. Roman law was much like our law. As a matter of fact, our law is based on laws from England, which drew some of their laws in from the Roman templates. So Pilate went to the crowd. He went out to a vast crowd that had gathered to witness this. Pilate had a plan. He was entitled to pardon one prisoner per year. And he said, I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. The crowd will side with me. He was sure they would choose Jesus. So in John 18, 39 to 40, he says, what is truth? With this, he went out again to the Jews and gathered there and said, I find no basis to even charge this man. Notice he's not saying he's not guilty. He said, I can't even, I don't even know what the charge is. But he said, it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release Jesus, the king of the Jews? But they showed it back. No, not him. No, give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. That was a capital punishment crime. So Pilate renders the verdict of innocent, which, by the way, he never changes. No fault. Innocent. Three times Pilate announces the complete innocence of Jesus Christ. But then look what he does in the beginning of chapter 19. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together corn 
crowns of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They slapped him in the face. <coughs> I won't go into the flogging. Just to say, I've studied it this week and it turns my stomach. This was extra. According to the divine plan of God, Jesus Christ had to die. Understand that. But the disfigurement of his body was extra. God knew they would do it. God knew that he didn't have to send Jesus there and have the Jews crucify him he knew that men who had sinful hearts would do it in the presence of Jesus. And he's right, because men and women with sinful hearts today, we still do it. But this was done with metal shards, shards woven into a whip. And it is a matter of record that many who were about to be crucified by the Romans were whipped like this before they went to the cross and died of the beating alone. Then they dressed the Son of God up as a clown with a gigantic crown of thorns and a purple robe and made him hold a reed in his hand as a scepter and shoved this disfigured form out to the people. And look at verse 19, verse, chapter 19, verse 2 and 3 again. Just, just look at it again. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again and again and again and said, Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews. Ho, ho, ho. Hail, Your Majesty. And they slapped him in the face. Oh, the patience of Jesus. The self-control of Jesus. This is breaking every cardinal law in the Roman law and the Jewish law that was designed to give a person a fair and respectful trial. This is nothing but obscene. Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in. What it meant for thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. But I come back to Pilate. Have you ever seen a politician more tortured than Pilate? Frightened, frustrated, Pilate goes back to Jesus to appeal to him. He says, come on, man, work with me on this. I think we can get out of it. He's like a cat on a hot tin roof. He keeps going in and out of his residence. He keeps going in to try to get Jesus to listen to reason. And then he goes out to try and bargain with the crowds to see if they'll change their mind. He goes in and out, in and out. 1829 says he went out. 1833 says he went back in. 1838 says he goes out again. 191 says he goes back in. 194, he comes out again. 199, he goes back in again. He, 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 he doesn't know what to do. And then John 1833 to 37 Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Man, are you the king of the Jews? Do the Jews have a king? And Jesus said, Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Do you have witnesses? Are you bringing witnesses now? 
Pilate said, am, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What? what? And then he said, what is it that you have done that's made them so mad? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's important. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Oh, so you are a king then? Pilate said, maybe I'm getting some traction here. Maybe I can put you to death. And... and then it all falls apart again for him. Jesus, I want you to note some things about this. He said, first of all, my kingdom is not of this world. It is in this world. It is in the hearts of men and women. It includes this world because Jesus owned it. But the world didn't give the kingdom to Jesus, and the world can't take it away. Do you remember Jesus' words in his prayer in John 17? Jesus said, after Jesus had said this, he looked towards heaven, prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Look at the words. For you granted him authority over all. All people. We can't simply vote Jesus in and vote him out at will. He's not a politician that we vote in or out or a pastor in some traditions where they vote them in or out. He is the sovereign son of God. And after the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus says in Matthew 28 and 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So let's get this straight. There is no court of appeal above Jesus Christ. He is God. God the Son through whom everything, John said, that was created was created through him, by him, for him. He is not a manager. He's not just a prime minister who answers to a parliament, who answers to the people. He is the owner of everything. He owns you. He owns me. The second thing Jesus said is, my defense would not come from here if I called for it. You're looking at those 12 disciples out there, he said, that's not who I'd call for defense. Jesus said when he was arrested, he could have called for a legion of angels if he wanted them. That is believed to be up to 10,000 angels. Let me read to you what one angel did in a battle from Kings 19.35. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death. That angel, an angel of the Lord, an, an angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian army. One angel. One. Jesus said, I could have called... 10,000 of them. But then again, God is the one who gives the angels the powers they have. So Jesus, God the Son, didn't need an angel. He could have turned Pilate to a pillar of dust all on his own if it was in the divine plan. And this is the man that they mocked, slapped, spit upon, struck, sneered at. And then John 19, 7 to 9, which I think gets at the heart of everything. The Jewish leaders insisted we have a law. According to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace. Now, this could be the Son of God. Who, who is this man? King of the Jews, Son of God? What am I handling here? Very afraid. 
And he went back inside the palace and said, where do you come from? You know, are you from another planet or something? Are you extraterrestrial? Where, where, where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Father, that said, don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus spoke up then. He said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Notice verse 10. He said, do you refuse to speak to me? Alistair Begg, whose commentary has influenced me greatly concerning this passage, says in the Greek it speaks of Pilate's incredulity. He says, to me, this is the way it's formed in the Greek, to me, you refuse to speak? Do you know who I am? Jesus, do you know who you're talking to? Do you refuse to give a an account of yourself? Do you refuse to explain yourself to Pilate? I'm offended by you, Jesus. You're not taking me seriously. I'm the governor. You're not answering my objections. You're not willing to negotiate with the man who wields the greatest power on earth over you. I have the power of life and death death over you. And the world is offended at Jesus, by the way. They're maddened by him. They're maddened by the gospel. They're maddened by the Bible. As a matter of fact, they've discarded it and said, it can't be true because there's no explanations here for us. There's not enough scientific evidence here for us. We're not going to have faith in God that we can't see, measure, count, weigh. We'll bow down to something that was tangible, something like money or something like corporations, corporate power, or something like fame and fortunes and mansions and big cars. But we're not bowing down to a God unless he comes down here and gives us a high five. Do you refuse to speak to me? And Jesus said, you'd have no power over me if it wasn't given you from above. That statement makes me sit down and sit back and say, what's really going on here? Pilate was only in the driver's seat because God gave him a driver's license. Jesus was saying, you can only reject me because God has given you the right to reject me. You can only crucify me because God is going to let you crucify me. Can I tell you that the God-given right that you have to reject Jesus Christ is just that, a God-given right. And that he doesn't strike you down in the face of your rebellion. That he doesn't strike me down every time I stray from him. And that's what I'm like, said the prophet Isaiah. We're like sheep that's constantly wandering astray and causing the shepherd pain and, and, and heartache. We're gone astray. And that word in Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. It's a lament phrase. And it's the word tawa, tawa. As God is saying, they're gone astray. They're gone astray again. It's a wonder God did not wipe out every single one of us. But instead he patiently, says Peter, waits. The clown that you're punching in the nose with your rejection is 
the Son of God. He allows you to reject him. I said it this morning, he doesn't want to force anybody to go to heaven. You have a right to reject him. You do. Now listen to me. It would not have changed the outcome. Jesus was going to die on that cross for sure. He came to die on that cross. But Pilate found the innocence of Jesus quite compelling. John 19.12 says, From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders... They were Jesus' pastor. They should have been Jesus' protector. They had the highest religious office in the land. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Three very brief observations. One, Pilate had a personal dilemma. He personally believed Jesus was innocent, and he does not want to crucify Jesus. Secondly, he has a political dilemma. He does not want to insult Caesar. Thirdly, he had a public dilemma. He did not want to side with Jesus against the crowd. Well, what would the perplexed, perplexed, paralyzed, polarized, petrified Pilate do? Hear this, will you? may not be a well-written sentence, but it's a powerful one. Pilate decided to do the thing that had the least immediate cost. He crucified Jesus. He had an opportunity to say, I will not be party to this. Pilate could have stood up and said, you can take him and crucify him if you wish, but I will not be party to this. I am not going to send this man to his death because I find no fault in him. I find him to be credible. I don't know. No. No. Every day his word, his death and resurrection is being trivialized and trashed all around the world, in the church and out of the church, sad to say. I heard a preacher, no, I can't go there. It just made me so mad. This guy who said, I, I, he, he calls, they call themselves the Freedom Project now, where everything that I hold sacred in this word They've risen up a big organization and still have the gall to call themselves Christian while denouncing the truth and the veracity of the word of God. No, sir. No, sir. Every day his word, his death and resurrection is being trivialized and trashed all around us. And not only on television, but right in front of you and me. And the question becomes, what will you do with Jesus? Some sinners will not seek him because of the crowd. 
some sinners will not seek him because of the crowd. And some saints will not serve him because of the cost. Did you get it? Some sinners will not seek him because of the crowd. Some saints will not serve him because of the cost. And the crowd chants, crucify him, crucify him. Will I hand him over again to be crucified? Again and again and again and again. Or as Brian played, will we say, though crosses come, I'll not turn back. Who will stand up for Jesus, the lowly Nazarene, and raise the blood-stained banner amidst the host of sin? Who will follow Jesus amid reproach and shame? Where others shrink or falter, who glory, who will glory in his name? So I ask you, governor of your own life, I ask you, I ask myself, what will you do with Jesus? Maybe those words could come back up again, I'll not turn back. Maybe, Brian, you could just play it. And maybe you could think about those words. I'm humbled. Tonight, I, I'm struck. I'm struck by this. I, I have no room for pride in this story. I, I can't say it's about I'm the most important one. It's I'm struck. And I am compelled. I have only one response to this. I have only one response. And that is to kneel before him tonight. I have only one response. I have only one response.
musical, the musical Glory, written by one of our former generals of the Salvation Army. And every time I hear it, I wish I was young again so I could start all over. Because you see, I'm called, but we're all called as believers. But doesn't Satan like to try to discourage us? I think of this past year. I think about Lauren's illness. And then I think about after Christmas. And I'll share with you, I had to hold Lauren to get him into this year. He didn't think he could give it anymore. He didn't think he had the strength. He didn't think that we could give you what you needed. And I said, Lord, Lauren, the Lord's not releasing us from this ministry. And we began this year, and when we came back after our holidays, oh, God's been so affirming. Time after time, we're seeing God moving, and we're sensing his spirits moving, and that's confirmation that God's still, still got a work to do here, and he still wants to use us. And he still wants to use you. You see, we can't do it alone. We're together, aren't we? We're together. We're all called to love and to save the lost through Jesus Christ. And sometimes there's pain. And lots of times there's discouragement. But God is faithful. And all he asks of us is not huge success, huge ability, huge talent. He says, be faithful. Do what Marlene did. Pray that God would lead you to people. And then with stammering tongues, somehow, speak the appropriate word at the appropriate moment, and God uses it for his honor and his glory. Oh, can you say it and can you mean it tonight? Considering what Jesus Christ has done for us, can you say, I'll not turn back. I'm called to live, to love, and save the lost. No matter what the cost, I'll not turn back. And some of you are paying heavy prices. Some of you got difficulties. Satan, when he sees anything good happening, he tries to destroy it, tries to discourage it, but will not turn back when we consider what Jesus has done for us. Let's stand. Let's sing it from the depths of our hearts. I'll not turn back.
Do we know the, uh, you know the verse, don't you? Come on up. We're, we're not sure. The three of us are, two of us, three of us are not sure we know it. So come up. If God picked up the sparrow that could no longer fly and he dust off his wings, we can trust Jesus. If God picked up the sparrow that could no longer fly,
to, but uh, I felt it was time I'd better get back up here, and, uh, and uh, I, I know that uh, there's still lots to do, but there's a chorus that's been going through my mind, and I, I want us to sing it. Here am I, so unworthy of the blood. And I gotta ask the question, I'm gonna ask the question, is there anybody here tonight that you don't know Jesus Christ, but you're gonna walk out and say, I wish I'd gone forward tonight. I wish I'd gone up and let somebody lead me to Jesus Christ tonight. My goodness, don't leave like that. Don't leave and go home disappointed. Don't leave it and say, well, maybe next Sunday night. No, don't do that. No, don't do that. You can come tonight. You say, but uh, Major is late in the meeting. Well, listen here. We'll, we'll serve breakfast here if we've got to. If you want to come to Christ, it's not late. I don't ever want it to be too late for you to come to Christ. You get me? So if you want to come to Jesus, if you want to come to him tonight, say, I should have gone tonight. Shoulda, coulda, no. Do it as we sing it. Here am I, so unworthy of the blood. song tonight. I'll go in the strength of the Lord. And uh, that's what we're going to do. Listen, it's not me you need. It's not Barb you need. It's Jesus you need. And the second thing I want to say to this congregation, let's all keep it real, hey? Let's be genuine in our worship and our praise and we'll never let pride come in and keep us from Serving the Lord. Let's give them everything we've got. This is going to be a great week. Prayer meetings are getting, uh, they're just unbelievable. Wednesday night, half an hour, 7 to 7.30. Sunday morning, 7 o'clock, men's prayer meeting here at the table. Prepared for us at the throne of grace. Come on. What, am I missing other prayer meetings? Oh. What, uh, 10.30 in the morning out in the room. Did you know there's a prayer meeting here 10.30 in the morning out in the room? Out here, and there's a dozen, 15 or so who, who, who meet and lay hold of the Lord. You, you can go to that prayer meeting. You will have you back in time for the place. You can put a marker on your seat if you want to. And, uh, and, and, and come, because... Without that prayer, we're done. Tuesday night's Bible study, we're into the, the, the book of Acts, and uh, the Lord's going to bless us there. Come on. Come on. we gotta, we got to do that. We, we, we need that. We need it. And uh, more to come. More to come. I'm going to pray the benediction, and then we're going to sing the last song. All right? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the grace that you won for us so beautifully and passionately on that cross. 
We saw but the surface of it tonight. If we could only see what was going on in your heart at that moment as you took the sins of the world upon yourself. Oh, Lord, but the surface was tough enough to watch. We love you, Lord, for it. Thank you for dying for us. We're not worthy of it, but you make us worthy through your blood to walk with you in white. Lord, bless us as we go in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be our portion now and forevermore. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. I love you. Let's sing together.